inaugurated the session officially by delivering his welcome speech. Sir, please. Thank you, Shoma. Uh, good evening to all of you. On behalf of the Department of Chemistry and also team of Asansol Girls, Girls College, on my personal behalf, I welcome all of you, all honorable and most respected delegates. At the outset, I convey my thanks and gratitude to the speakers who gives us valuable time, who gives, who spend some valuable time with us in this evening, and uh, uh, they will speak on recent advances of sensors, bio <coughs> screening, biosensing for COVID-19 kits and spectroscopic tools for detention of uh, toxic metals. I think uh, one of the relevant topics in the context of the present scenario. So uh, we are eagerly waiting the uh, speech of the speaker so that we can enlighten ourselves about the topic. And without much wasting my time, I uh, thanks to all again all of you and uh, requesting the organizer to start immediately uh, the session of this seminar. Thank you. Thank you once again for your kind words, sir. You always inspire and support us to organize this kind of knowledge-based event. Thank you. Now, I hand over the session to Dr. Lina Boom. Thank you, Shoma. Good evening, everybody. And I, uh, I Dr. Lina Bhumik of Asansol Gas College, would like to welcome all of you to the technical session of today's international webinar. From the very beginning of this year, who emphasized on testing for early detection and to combat the coronavirus. But traditional RT-PCR method for detecting COVID-19 needs facility, skilled human resource, and time. At this hour of crisis, Dr. Dipanjan Pan headed a group of researchers to find a simple technique to identify COVID-19 infections on the very first day of transmission. Dr. Pan, is a professor in diagnostic radiology and nuclear medicine, pediatrics and chemical, biochemical and environmental engineering in University of Maryland Baltimore School of Medicine and University of Maryland Baltimore. He did his MSc from Vidyasagar University. After that, he joined for PhD program in IIT Kharagpur. After completion of PhD, he went to USA for further advancement in his career. He is expert in nanomedicine, molecular imaging, drug delivery, and of course, biosensing. He merges fundamental chemistry, biology, and engineering to bring solutions for today's healthcare problem. His research is highly collaborative and interdisciplinary. He published more than 200 research papers in high-impact peer-reviewed journal. He edited and co-authored of two books on nanomedicine and other personalized medicine with nanochemistry. He has more than 20 US patents. He is also the recipient of numerous awards. Some of them are Nanomaterials Letter Researcher Award in 2016, Young Innovator Award from Biomolecular Engineering Society in 2017, Dean's Award for Research Excellence in 2018. He is also the member of multiple committee Few are fellow of Royal Society of Chemistry, fellow of American Heart Association, and elected fellow of American College of Cardiology. The Department of Chemistry of Asansul Gas College is highly privileged by getting him among us. Now, it's the time to hear the man behind the success of early diagnostic approach in the hour of crisis. I welcome Dr. Dipanjun Pan to this international webinar platform. Dr. Pan, please proceed with your presentation. Thank you, Linadi. Uh, that's a great introduction. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Asanjal College, for um, inviting me for a lecture. I, uh, I'm actually following like how many participants are joining. So I, I see like, like uh, 208 participants. So this is this is really impressive. So um, uh, the, thank you, thank you so much for. Um, for organizing this. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to share my slides right now. And um, 
uh, give you a brief uh, presentation on uh, the COVID work. Mainly, I'm going to focus on the COVID work, uh, not really on um, other things that my lab does, um, and, and just restrict myself to uh, COVID-19 because of the time and, uh, um, and uh, you know, the relevance of, um, of the work. So um, anyway, so um, I'm going to share my slides and... Uh, Can you see the slides? It's visible. It's visible? Okay, yes. great. Yes. Uh, all right. So, um, <clears throat> I'm just trying to. So, as uh, um, uh, Dr. Vomik pointed out, that um, if I'm based in uh, Maryland, USA and uh, um, a professor in, uh, I have a dual appointment between uh, two institutes and uh, my lab just moved from, um, just moved from uh, University of Illinois to um, uh, University of Illinois, Auburn Champaign to University of Maryland, Baltimore. And I have uh, multiple affiliations and um, um, uh, appointments uh, between these two institutes. Um, so, <clears throat> what's going on? Something going on with the. There are two lines, and which I'm not quite sure why those are appearing. These are not. These are coming from somebody else, and someone is requesting an access to to give control. Any idea? Can you hear me? All right, I think I think I just need to ignore. Uh, I don't know what is going on. There's, there's something going on. <laughs> Okay, um, so, so my lab is, uh, uh, there are two labs right now. Um, I can, uh, just to give you a brief background of where we are. Um, so this is the uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where um, one of my lab is there. It's a wet lab um, in vitro, ex vivo and small animal studies are typically done. A nanosynthesis and small molecule, um, um, uh, small molecule synthesis and in vitro assays are performed. We're also located in downtown Baltimore um, in the eighth floor of uh, Health Sciences Facility. Um, and, um, uh, and there we have a nanosynthesis um, uh, capability. And I also direct uh, um, a core facility over there for nanoparticle fabrication and characterization. And um, also I direct an imaging probe development uh, resources and characterization core. Um, so both the labs have um, um, you know, students, uh, graduate students and uh, postdocs and uh, research scientists and they interact with each other um, uh, quite often and they have access to um, um, uh, both the facilities. Um, I started as a, as a chemist, like all of you here, I guess most of you um, are trained as a chemist. I started as a chemist, but then um, uh, my research became very translational. And right now we try to combine uh, a lot of chemistry, biology and engineering to bring a uh, solution to a uh, human problem. Um, these are all translatable. And that's one of the reason we have multiple startups. I uh, founded or co-founded multiple companies for um, uh, translating our research ideas. For example, this is one company, um, Insight uh, Technology, that develops um, um, solution for or biosensors for detecting eye injuries. Um, and the other company here, you're looking at Kelocyte. That company develops um, 
the technologies uh, developed in my lab for um, uh, as a synthetic blood, artificial blood. So there, and there is also another company called Vitruvian Bio, which is uh, uh, developing our COVID-19 um, sensing approaches. So these are all very multidisciplinary, um, um, multidisciplinary um, approaches and for detection, therapy and sensing. What we're interested in is in early detection of a disease. And we try to understand the disease from uh, a whole body to organ to, um, uh, to a tissue level and then to a cellular level and to a molecular level, because we believe that um, an early detection is the key for um, any therapy. And um, if we detect early, then we'll be able to treat them early. And we call it a medicine. And uh, to, in order to do that, we combine different tools, for example, um, highly sensitive imaging tools. Um, and uh, of course, by keeping our, uh, uh, you know, the central essence of our research um, uh, intact, which is the chemistry. So the foundation of our research is chemistry. So we bring novel chemistry approaches, but then utilize these different tools for, um, uh, for bringing multidisciplinary approach for early detection at a different scale. So from whole body to organ, to tissue, to, um, um, you know, blood clot or tumor, or angiogenesis, looking at a, uh, uh, developing new blood vessels, or even at, uh, at, um, at a cellular level and at a, at a, at a molecular level. Um, so over the years, we have been publishing, um, um, you know, for, thanks to all uh, the great people that work in the lab, we have been publishing quite a bit on uh, the nanoprobes for imaging. Uh, we combine uh, multiple imaging techniques. Some of them are clinically applicable. Some of them are uh, only for animal imaging, only for preclinical. Uh, but we try to combine everything. Uh, for example, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, or computer tomographic imaging. Uh, we combine uh, Raman imaging or photoacoustic imaging or hyperspectral imaging. So there are uh, a wide range of tools that we, uh, we try to use and, um, and, and bring uh, strategies for early detection of a disease. The other approaches really are you know, more uh, chemistry oriented, more uh, classical chemistry, where we try to develop either new drug or a repurposed drug. So our strategy is really to um, uh, develop um, um, uh, uh, drugs that can be quickly translated to clinics. That means the drugs that are already um, um, available uh, in the market or FDA approved, clinically approved, we try to see that whether those drugs can be uh, utilized for uh, a, a particular um, 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 a disease um, uh, which has not been intended uh, for previously. Um, so we we apply a lot of chemistry approaches here, starting from uh, a very typical lead optimization uh, drug discovery and go after uh, different uh, drug targets. For example, transcription factors for oncogenes, signaling pathways for stem cell targeting, um, and uh, combinatorial therapy. That means we combine different kinds of drugs to see whether that has any effect on uh, treating tumors or other diseases. Um, so um, a very uh, holistic approach towards um, uh, treating a disease from early detection and therapy. But today's talk is not really, um, not really something for, um, uh, for, for these, but uh, uh, really this is about the, um, um, this is about COVID-19. And uh, um, uh, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna give you a very, uh, uh, overall background of what COVID-19 pandemic is doing to us and, uh, and how we really can um, solve um, by making an early detection of the disease. So as you all know that we, you know, since the COVID-19 happened, our life really changed. And that's, uh, um, it is true for the way we do research. So um, and as researchers, as scientists, our responsibility is to respond to the 
global need, and that's what we are doing right now. My lab never worked on infectious diseases before, um, and this is only, it's been a few months that we are working on it, and uh, we have made tremendous progress. And so, you know, COVID-19, in a sense, changed it, all of our, um, you know, everyone's um, life. So the first case was reported in China back in December 2019. So this report is really contradictory a little bit because uh, we are now hearing a lot of uh, debates that uh, the, the case might have happened uh, um, uh, at least uh, uh, two months earlier than that, that they reported. Uh, nevertheless, um, WHO, they recognized the outbreak as a pandemic on um, 11th March, 2020. Um, and this data is a little old, the slides are a little old, I think, um, but I think these numbers are way up now, but uh, more than 7 million worldwide confirmed cases, as we know, due to uh, the COVID-19. Um, in, in the US alone, I mean, we are leading from the front, uh, we, you know, ironically speaking, uh, that we have more than 2.5 million cases in the U US in, as of uh, June 2020, and that uh, counting from January 2022, uh, June 2022. So in five, six months, we have more than 2 million cases. Um, so WHO has you know, uh, you know, confirmed that this is a global pandemic. And then how to control this thing is by doing a global mass testing. And in fact, what we're talking today in the US is uh, doing a pool testing. That means we will, co we will collect, we'll select a particular neighborhood, and then we will select um, um, uh, the, and we collect, uh, um, you know, um, the samples, either um, saliva or nasal swab, and then we will test it as a whole. Um, and then if one particular neighborhood becomes positive, then they will go deeper. So the pool testing is coming. So the global mass testing is going to help us a lot. And the demand is going up every day. So more than 400,000 deaths worldwide, and in the US alone, we have more than 150,000 deaths. Um, in India also, it is rapidly growing. And the problem with uh, countries like uh, India, China, where uh, population is high, uh, the density is high, what is going to happen is that once this starts spreading, um, it will be really, really difficult to control. So what we really need is a, a rapid testing, a global testing method um, that we can think of. Um, so to give you a little bit of uh, uh, to give you a little bit of understanding of uh, um, um, what we are doing about um, our uh, the the COVID nineteen genetic profile. Uh, so the identity of the COVID nineteen is very similar to um, bat co. That means the COVID nineteen virus that comes from bat. Um, it's almost ninety five percent. Uh, for pangolin, it's the 91%, and you probably have been hearing um, bat and COVID, um, sorry, pangolin um, um, source um, in the in the newspaper. Um, so SARS-CoV-1, that's the SARS virus that we know, uh, that has a similarity of about 80% with uh, uh, the COVID-19, whereas the Mars virus has only 55% of um, 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 similarity uh, with uh, 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 with um, with this virus. So, um, sorry. Um, so, the virus, if you look at it, then it, it is it is a tiny virus. It's not really uh, not really very big. It's only thirty thousand base pairs. Um, and so, the SARS-CoV-2 genome, it's really tiny. And um, it's the time for the mutation is also very. Um, it's not that fast, you know, in compared to some of the other viruses, it's, it's almost like uh, um, in, in every two days, I think it, it kind of mutates a little bit. Um, and then SARS-CoV-2 uses a protein called spike protein that is on the surface. It's a, called S protein, and that's optimized for binding to um, a, um, an, a receptor in human cells called ACE2 receptor. And, and this is a natural selection. So they will bind and they'll be taken up by the host cells or uh, the human cells. So that's our, um, uh, that's our understanding of the virus um, so far. So it has a lot of similarity uh, to, um, to the 
to 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 the to the SARS-CoV and some of the other viruses that have been found from um, uh, from from uh, bat and pangolin, but it is going to change a little bit with mutation. Now, so the global COVID-19 diagnostic market, and you can see that it's almost like eight or eight to nine billion dollar market opportunity. So it's huge. The market size value in 2020, looking at six billion, which is a, a, and a revenue of forecast is a, more than nine billion dollar in just in COVID-19 detection. If you look at some of the um, some of the techniques that are being used right now, then you will see the most widely used and commonly used technique is um, RT-PCR, which is uh, the technique that is used in the hospitals. And that technique is highly specific. It has a, a very high sensitivity for detection. But if you look at this uh, first column, then you will see um, that the red uh, rows indicate what is the negative part? So the negative part is really the test time, which is uh, more than 120 minutes for one single test and a sample to answer time. So you are dropping off the sample at the hospital and you're expecting a result back. It's on an average is four to six. I think they're trying to do it very fast now, but it is still not uh, less than a day. So it's more than a day, one to two days for a sample to answer time. The technology is really matured, but it is not accessible to everyone. Think about a situation where it happens in the developing countries. Uh, not all the labs are uh, have the capability uh, to have to have RDPCR. This is an expensive equipment. Um, it requires skilled personnel to run uh, these tests. Point of care tests. That means the tests that can be done um, at the at the site of uh, the testing. That means the person comes in, you collect the samples and you start testing. That is rapidly coming up. And uh, the, the only downside is that it's sensitivity needs to go up. The, and also the price needs to be, needs to go down because in order for us to increase the, um, the, the capability of point of care tests or increase the um, um, applicability of uh, the point of care test, uh, we need to bring the cost down. The next column is talking about LFAs and that is a lateral flow assay. And the lateral flow assay and uh, um, the point of care tests. So those are really, uh, those can be combined together and uh, bring some hybrid system. And those hybrid system really uh, can give probably uh, a much better solution for uh, COVID-19 testing. Let's look at some of the type of the things that are happening right now as a competitor. So serological test, that means the test where we collect blood and we try to test, try to see whether the person has COVID-19 or not. And these are all clinically approved test. Most of these big companies like Abbott and other type of companies, they are developing something that are based on collecting the blood and looking for the signature of a virus. And I will explain in a minute uh, that why this approach is not going to give us uh, the best result. Because of this target analyte, if you're looking at the target analyte, um, then this is, um, or these tests are looking at antibody. Either it could be IgG or IgM antibodies that we are, uh, that they are trying to go after. This is just a competitor. I'm, I'm just gonna skip this slide. So now let's look at the characteristic of um, the characteristics of the, uh, the virus. And um, uh, I'm gonna bring this down so that everyone can see. I'm not sure whether you can see my slides. Um, so the characteristic infection progression in a single patient. So if you look at this slide, then you will see that the virus infection that happens over here, that's the latent period. And that's almost like a three days time. The incubation period is five days. And up to that period, the patient really remains asymptomatic. That means you're not really coughing. 
you're not really presenting with any symptoms. You don't have fever, you don't have headache, you don't have um, uh, uh, breathing problem, nothing. So at that point, the patient has been exposed to the virus. The virus is there in the latent stage, but it is there, it is present. And then right after that, the virus becomes symptomatic, the patient becomes symptomatic. So the diagnosis after five days, this becomes symptomatic. So this is where we're trying to address that if the patient becomes symptomatic, we are already quite late in terms of detecting the patient and treat the patient. And not only that, but also to a point that this person probably by that time, by that five days period, that person has probably already infected 100 different people because whoever that person has come in contact with, those people have also been infected with this uh, virus. This is what we, we're trying to avoid. This is where we're trying to get at that we really need to go after this latent period, the three days period, where we need to detect the, the virus, where the patient is not really presenting with any kind of symptoms, but the virus is present. So if you look at the, the fatality rate, that means the, the, the rate of the death for, um, for these uh, patients is around one to 15%. And the recovery of the mild cases is two weeks to severe cases in six weeks. So the test for SARS-CoV-2, if you look at this is a little bit of a complicated slide. And so one of the reasons that's why I, I tried to make a simpler slide that shows that the curve, if you look, look at this curve that um, the, the blue one, green one, and red one, that shows that how our body is responding to the presence of the virus. Our body, is, our human system is really made in such a way that any foreign body, any foreign subject that enters our body, then our immune system will react to that. And then what that will do, that they will start reacting, it will start developing antibody uh, for, uh, to, to, tackle, to tackle that infection. So all these antibodies like IgG, IgA, and IgM are in response to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. But if you look at the x-axis, then you will see that the time is really 14 days where uh, really that's 14 to uh, 20 days where um, the, the presence of the antibody kind of picks. And that's where, if we're trying to go after this serological test, then we are going to detect this virus very, 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 very late. So what we're doing is that we are trying to propose some strategies where we can really detect the virus at a very early, as early as the first day of the infection, uh, the initial exposure to SARS-CoV-2, we're trying to detect the virus at there. So the early detection is the key, and we really cannot rely on the serological test going after antibody because our body is not going to generate antibodies until it is too late, until it is seven to 14 days at least. So our best bet is RNA-based detection. As we all know that every living individual would have an unique RNA. So, so as SARS-CoV-2 or so as uh, the, the COVID-19, so the COVID-19 causative virus is SARS-CoV-2, and SARS-CoV-2 has a very unique RNA. We are going after those, that, those RNA for, uh, to bring some uh, point of care solution to COVID-19 sensing. Um, our other criteria for developing this would be uh, limited resource use, easy to operate, highly sensitive, needs to have the lowest detection range possible at a point of care level. It doesn't really matter whether it has the limit of detection as high as point um, PCR, but at least it should have uh, the capability to, to give us an answer at a point of care level. Should have the high specificity, that means it should not confuse with other coronaviruses or MARS viruses or influenza viruses? How do we know that whether I have COVID-19 or I have a very regular um, you know, uh, influenza or flu? So the sensor needs to be able to um, uh, you know, um, uh, separate these, um, uh, the virus strains from each other. 
to know the enemy. I think uh, it's very important for us to um, to to know what we are fighting against. So this is the kind of the structure of the virus in the cross section that shows that it has multiple proteins, as you can see here, that the um, that the S protein. This is the on the surface. So this is called S protein, or known as a spike trimer. And that is known to bind to the SEE2 inhibitor, oh, sorry, SEE2 um, uh, receptors, uh, which is present in um, any uh, human cells. And that will be primed by uh, um, um, another, another protein called TMPRSS2. And, uh, and then by this way, uh, the virus will get inside uh, the cell. And then um, there are other proteins, for example, E proteins and uh, also uh, the most important one is the nucleoprotein because the nucleoprotein or N protein is something that we are interested in because it does not really go um, um, and undergo any kind of mutation. And that is really, really important because when we started in, in my lab, we started working um, with SARS-CoV-2, we received samples from Nigeria. And then those Nigerian virus and then we started getting samples from Wuhan, China, and then we started exploring samples from uh, the US. And uh, um, so what is happening is that um, is uh, all these viruses or all these virus, uh, viral RNA coming from different locations, they have a slightly different genetic makeup because they are going, going through a mutation process. The mutation typically happens to the spike uh, trimer. So that in order for that, the spike trimer is not really a good target to go after. What is a good target? The tar good target is the nucleoprotein or N protein or N gene, because the N gene is a nuclear target and it remains unaltered over the time. So this is a fair bit of, uh, um, you know, this is a safe target and we, we really need to go after this engine so that it does not really come up or does not really mute it and we can come up with an universal biosensing approach. So what we did that, um, this is again a, a classical molecular recognition um, um, uh, strategy. Um, it is um, the design principle of antisense oligos targeting engine where we have a four point binding that allows a strong attachment to the end protein. We are coming up with the antisense oligonucleotides. Um, so we developed uh, um, and patented um, uh, um, uh, four antisense oligos that has the capability uh, to bind to, two of them has the capability to bind to the front location of the, uh, the viral RNA or the end protein and then two of them is the capability to bind to the end location. The reason we're using four targeting ligand is in order for us to get, get a really strong hold onto the, um, onto the, onto the vital um, uh, genetic material. Um, so it kind of forms a claw so that it binds really tightly and, and we don't get any false negative results. So this is the backbone 3 d structure of the antisense oligos um, and um, um, sorry. Um, so this is a background 3D structure of the antisense um, um, single-stranded DNA probe and uh, the backbone 3D structure of antisense uh, DNA probe, uh, P2, and that shows that um, um, and these are um, the, the ASO1, ASO2, ASO3, ASO4, and those were conjugated to something called gold nanoparticles. So we all know what gold nanoparticle is. Gold nanoparticle has been around for long, 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 long time. In, you know, I think uh, uh, from the days of, uh, um, um, uh, you know, Egyptian civilization, so 4,000 years old, literally, um, these, um, um, these particles. So those were so gold nanoparticles. Those were capped with these antisense oligos. You can see that this is a transmission electron microscopic image that shows these particles are very, very um, uh, clearly separated out. There is no um, aggregation or nothing. They're very finely well-behaving particles. Now, in, look what is happening in presence of the SARS-CoV-2 N protein. So this is the blue thing is the N protein. And then there we see 
a rate shift in the absorbance or um, in the lambda, it's 40 nanometer rate shift, and that is leading from a clustered gold nanoparticle. So what happens that when um, the ASO conjugated gold nanoparticles comes in contact with uh, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 engine, then there will be a rush of these gold particles coming to each other, and they will start precipitating out or aggregating out. And then as a result of that, these clustered gold nanoparticles, as you can see here, that those will be uh, those can be seen. And then as we know that these gold particles are plasmonic nanoparticles, that means they change their color with size. So we started with 20 nanometer gold particle and then we are ending up with, uh, um, you know, 100 to 200 nanometers of gold clusters. And that uh, change in the size is, uh, is responsible for a rate shift. And that shift is really uh, uh, giving us a color change. So you can see here that um, the when we started the ASO capped gold particles, this is purple in color. Um, then we're mixing the viral RNA, uh, five minutes of incubation. And then um, you see the color is changing. This is uh, from purple, it got changed to blue. Then what we're doing is we are adding RNAs H, which is 65 degrees centigrade incubation time for another five minutes. And then that will lead to a precipitation of the whole thing. So it's a very simplistic and inexpensive detection technique. Only 10 minutes it requires. Uh, it can be made quantitative if we connect it to a, a spectrophotometer. It can be integrated with lateral flow assay or even potentially be integrated with uh, um, a lamp assay. But Remember that this is something where we, we are not really requiring any amplification. So in, in classical PCR-based technique, you require an amplification because the RNA that is coming, it's very, very tiny. You really need to amplify the RNA in order for you to detect it. Here, no amplification is required because we are um, exploiting the multivalency of the nanoparticle and uh, a very high affinity of these antisense oligos to bind to those um, um, RNAs, um, um, uh, viral RNAs. It can also potentially be tagged with a color sensing mobile app. So the goal would be to um, give the patients or consumers that are sitting at home and by using this test strip, they can, and also by using their mobile phone uh, to generate color and uh, detect whether they have uh, COVID-19 or not. The next approach that we adopted was more electrochemical detection. And some of you know that, you know, it is, nowadays it is possible to uh, test whether you, uh, the, you have blood glucose or not. And then this is kind of a similar approach where we have, uh, uh, and there's a lot of chemistry and I'm not really going too much details in the chemistry here um, because uh, just for the, the sake of time and uh, um, also just to, to keep it really broad for the wide audience. Um, but what we're trying to do is trying to come up with, a, with an electrochemical detection technique. So here we have a graphene-based sensing approach where is a contour-based microelectrode and then gold nanoparticles that we developed previously are kind of immobilized on this uh, contour-based microelectrode. When the, when the viral RNA comes and binds to these um, um, ASOs, there will be a change in the, um, the overall impedance of, um, of the resistance of the graphene because graphene is conductive in nature. So this is a real-time detection and this is even faster. Um, only less than five minutes for a stable response is required. Uh, highly quantitative and our detection sensitivity reaches around the uh, femtomolar and that's almost at par at the PCR. So at a point of care level, reaching a PCR level sensitivity is not known right now. So this is what um, um, it's, it's extremely promising for, uh, for a mass testing or even a testing at um, a low resource um, settings. Um, so there are a bunch of data here that shows that how the sensor looks like on the graphene sensor platform. These are um, scanning electron microscopic image of the graphene based sensor. And this before and after the RNA, um, and, and, you know, it looks uh, fantastic. So this is the main data that shows that uh, these are the COVID-19 positive patient samples. You can see here um, the plot A, 
which shows the RAID plot, RAID graph is really the normal samples that means uh, the, the saliva that has been collected from patients with uh, no symptoms, presenting with no symptoms, no fever, nothing. That shows um, the result looks uh, fantastic. It's uh, almost a flat line. Uh, with the positive COVID-19, you can see the rapid rise of um, the, the, um, the, the impedance of the resistance change and over time of 100 to 200 seconds. So the only, it takes about 200 seconds to give uh, the result. Um, you can see that the comparison slide, um, plot that shows that um, the COVID-19 positive samples are um, really high, showing really high um, sensing in comparison to that of the normal sample. So, um, so our uh, clinical results shows really, really high promise in terms of uh, uh, the detection sensitivity and specificity. We tested it also with uh, other viruses, for example, Mars virus, uh, influenza virus, yellow fever, um, SARS-CoV-1, and uh, some other coronaviruses. And there is no cross-reactivity uh, with our, uh, our sensor. So we can easily say that our, our detection, our, our capability, our, our sensor has the specificity to um, um, almost, almost 100% of specificity that it really does not have a cross reactivity with any of these uh, uh, viruses. The final thing is I um, uh, wanted to give you a little bit of background on the hyperspectral imaging and I'll, I'll try to see what, how much time I have, I think maybe five minutes or so. Um, so hyperspectral imaging, it's kind of uh, um, something that um, it's like our human eye. So human eye sees everything in different colors. So our human eye works very uh, in modern nature. That's uh, that's how uh, God has created us. I think uh, if we believe in God, um, that we, everything we can see in color. Um, so if you're looking at a tree, it's uh, you know it's green and the grass is green and if you're looking at uh, the sky it's blue so everything we can we see in color and we can distinguish it how can we really generate something um, where uh, we can tick um, and you know it's like it's, it's like sending a white light through the prism so hyperspectral imager it look it works similarly so it acts like hundreds of spectrophotometer in parallel and then that will give you um, um, the slides or slices of uh, individual lights. And so, and it will generate a different color based on uh, the scattering of the material that we are uh, really looking at. So what we did, and I'm not gonna, I cannot really divulge too much here to go too much deep because this is confidentiality. We have uh, uh, multiple pattern application in process. Uh, my apologies for that. But what we're doing here is we're taking the same particles and we're trying to utilize the same antisense oligos and utilize this platform for detecting with this hyperspectral imaging um, uh, technique. So what you're looking at is the slide where the gold particle has been clustered. You can see that there's a very high level of clusters present. Um, now look on at the, you know, the, the, the right hand side, you're looking at the, uh, the plot and the peak, uh, peak heights, you can see that uh, when the RNA has been um, um, treated, you can see that we really can even go up to um, the zectomolar concentration. So this is really unbelievable because the results of 10 instantaneously. We add the virus sample and it will provide us um, uh, a result um, right after. By far the most sensitive detection technique as you know, so far has been reported in the literature. And it gives us an opportunity of uh, almost 50 times higher sensitivity than the PCR. It's highly quantitative. We can combine it with an algorithm to generate um, 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 an, an, a, a quantitative result. Uh, a very tiny sample volume, two microliter sample volume is what we, we really require. So, to in summarize, what we really um, achieved in 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 last few months, uh, while I think most of the labs were closed, but uh, we received um, 
spatial formation to work in the lab because we are working on COVID-19. Um, and, and, you know, hats off to all uh, my um, uh, folks, uh, the, the scientists in the lab. Uh, they have been working uh, day in and night to develop three platforms. Um, one um, gives results in about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, the second one, which is electrochemical, that gives results within five minutes. And the last one, which is hyperspectral, that is highly sensitive, almost the detection sensitivity is in a zeptomolar, but the results also uh, is instantaneous, almost instantaneous results uh, we get. All these three techniques are really coming from um, highly specific antisense oligos uh, for targeting N gene or N protein that is present in the, in the virus and a highly sensitive nanoparticle platform that has been developed in my lab. So uh, these are three approaches that we were looking at. So I just wanna conclude that our goal is really moving from symptomatic to preemptive medicine. We really don't want to wait until the symptom appears. We really want to develop something which, which will give us the answer right away. We, know, we would know even if we, we don't have a cough, we don't have fever, headache, or um, we're having trouble breathing, we will know whether we have the virus or not. So we, we, we really combine a molecule making and device making. So we're using antisense oligos, these are synthetic molecules. We're making those tiny molecules and then we are using it for devices. That means we are combining two completely different fields. One is chemistry, one is electrical engineering. We're combining these two different fields uh, to bring an early detection at a molecular level. What we're doing here is really going after the molecular level of the virus COVID-19. We have proposed a translatable solution for COVID-19. FDA approval process is in progress. Um, a a spin-off, a startup company, Vitruvian Bio, is trying to develop um, the plasmonic sensor. There is a strong interest from uh, many um, companies, uh, um, international and within the US companies, um, to partner with us to develop these, um, these tests. Some of the other tests like electrochemical and hyperspectral. Um, to acknowledge, this is uh, um, uh, my team. Um, uh, this is a little bit of older picture from Illinois, of uh, Christmas party. Um, you know, there's this fantastic team. I just cannot um, um, say more about them. Um, um, this, is, uh, this is all them. Um, uh, startups inside Kellocide, they're, uh, they're our, I founded those companies. Um, uh, funding we received from um, NIH, um, NSF, National Science Foundation, American Heart, uh, um, and the uh, US Army. Um, and uh, these are my esteemed collaborators um, around um, the country and beyond. And uh, finally, thank you so much for um, your attention um, and uh, thank you again, um, Dr. Vomik for inviting me to give a lecture. It's my pleasure and um, I will be happy to answer any question you have. Thank you Deepanjun for your excellent deliberation. I'm sure that all the participants must have enjoyed the session thoroughly because you explain the complex phenomena in a simple way. I also see that not only the student and the faculty members, but also the whole mankind will be benefited by your great work. You show us that with hard work, dedication and discipline, one can achieve anything as he is. Thank you once again, Professor Dipanjan. My pleasure, now thank I, you. Now I like to hand over the session to Dr. Shurajit Jana. Not audible. Still not audible. Surajitda, you are not audible. Unmute, first un unmute yourself. You are on mute, unmute yourself.
नॉट ऑडेबल प्लग आउट योर इयरफोन एंड से डायरेक्टली टू द डिवाइस plug out from device whether you are log in from mobile or laptop plug out plug out the jack plug out plug out प्रेजेंटेशन नाउ कपल ऑफ क्वेश्चन दिस इज फ्रॉम ऑयन राय and he is asking sir uh, is there any risk of infection for lab technicians who are working in the corona testing lab yep i actually uh, uh, responded on the chat um 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 and uh, yes of course i mean <laughs> there there is definitely risk i mean it's uh, <laughs> that's what so what you what what usually what we do we inactivate the virus so the virus when we there is a inactivation technique that uh, that that is recommended by cdc uh, but that does not inactivate the rna so you can still collect the rna and detect it so it does not uh, prevent us from uh, detecting the virus but the virus's um, uh, capability to uh, to transmit uh, or infect a human cell goes down so that's how we we need to we need to use it um otherwise you know whoever is working they will be they will be infected yes that's a good question okay sir so, so the next question is from shubhankori prashad from ramananda college vishnupur and he is asking whether nano formulated anti viral drug may be effective yeah. against n covid infection it can be of, of course it can be so the the, the thing is that so the, again i mean we we did not talk about the therapy and there is uh, also um some um uh, projects related to therapy is going on in my lab so what is going to happen um sooner or later is that not one drug is going to be useful for uh treating the covid um um, um you know covid um so there will be multiple drugs that needs to be given at a time 
So the time is coming when those drugs need to be delivered um, in a combinatorial fashion. That means uh, we need to we need to give those drugs at a time. And at that point, a nano nanoparticle nano nano formulation would be very um, useful for um, for providing a solution. Also, there is other possibility. For example, like uh, we know that there's a lot of talk going on that whether hydroxychloroquine or HCQ is uh, um, sensitive for um, for the virus, uh, and there are there are different kinds of um, um, you know uh, there's a, there's a there's a huge amount of debate whether it's uh, um, sensitive or not. Um, so, but one thing's for sure that it probably does some kind of effect, um, and um, which is understandable, but HCQ is not out of uh, um, the toxicity. Um, toxicity, um, you know, I think that I think it, it creates some of the tox toxicity in, in our body. So, if we're trying to deliver it by a nano formulation, uh, that will probably create a much better profile uh, for HCQ um, for uh, for COVID nineteen. So it can be delivered in a much more safer way. Thank you, sir. And um, sir, um, I have the, uh, two questions for you. Like, uh, like I work in a next generation sequencing platform. So uh, what I was uh, thinking that in your kit that you were directly using RNA in 320 nanogram, but this, uh, the purpose of developing this kit is to go for the community detection. So sir, as we know, the RNA is very fragile. Is it possible to how to control or how to deal with the RNA in community level in detection in terms of detection perspective? Yeah, so that's a good question. So it so the RNA is uh, even if it's fragile, it's not going to be not going to go away. It, it will it will stay. So uh, what you are basically asking that how the RNA can be isolated. So that technique is really integrated with our uh, platform and there are, uh, there are multiple, and this is, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. So there are multiple um, already, um, uh, already uh, pursued approaches for uh, quick isolation of RNA for saliva or nasal swab or other, other bodily fluid. So those techniques are integrated with our platform so that all you have to do is collect the saliva in um, in a in a VMT or um, something similar cup, and uh, uh, and the the whole process goes um, uh, kind of into in an integrated fashion, and it collects the RNA from um, the the collected saliva. Okay. And um, uh, okay, sir, so one more question uh, from my end. That is. A lot of uh, this uh, the research are going on about the BCG vaccination, uh, the effectiveness of the BCG vaccination on COVID-19. So uh, do you have, it, it, would you like to comment on this perspective that uh, uh, the vi like vaccine, vaccine like BCG, uh, how far it is uh, workable in terms of uh, this COVID-19 situation? How to, uh, does, does it have any effect on COVID-19? Or the SARS-CoV-2, what is uh, this? We don't know yet. So we don't know yet. So because this is uh, this is something um, uh, time will tell us, and uh, the clinical studies are going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I think uh, it is too early for us to uh, comment on that. Um, in fact, I would say that as every day we are we are seeing new new we are finding new things. We're learning new things. So uh, this virus is only it's been around for six months. Um, so there is a lot of things, there is a lot of research need to happen and a lot of clinical studies need to conduct to, um, uh, to make sure or to, to say that this is going to be effective. But a vaccination is, uh, is absolutely the, uh, the ultimate goal. Um, I don't see that coming in the next few months at least. Um, and if you read some of the lit news and, uh, you know, Dr. Fauci from US, and you know, I think he's, he has been saying that even the vaccine is only 75% of um, uh, effective for human, I think he would, he would go with that. So that means we are in, we are in dire, desperate need for um, a vaccine for COVID-19, even if it's uh, not 100% uh, effective. Uh, but so far, there's been, there's been, there's been none um, all around the world. There's uh, some clinical stuff going on, but um, uh, 
uh, not uh, there's no conclusive answer okay uh, thank you hello. so much sir thank you so much hello yes yes that you are audible there are a few more questions actually uh, actually asked by the participants like what are the basic instrument facility required for the uh, detection of the uh, covid 19 actually uh, in the lab what are the basic facility or basic instrumental facilities required to set up the so, covid 19 detectors so like i mentioned in my uh, in my talk that uh, usually in the in the clinic right now the, the only way they can do it by running the pcr and that's an rt pcr technique um, and um, that is uh, that is only available in the in the large diagnostic centers or large hospitals um, and that's one of the reasons we're trying to develop something that is more point of care, which can be given even into your hand, uh, something like a pregnancy kit, which you can get. And, uh, you know, like in pregnancy kit, they, uh, you know, uh, you can you, you can try uh, to detect the, the enzyme um, HCG by um, applying urine and uh, an immediate result will appear. So this is something that we were trying to develop, that an immediate result with enough specificity and sensitivity for uh, for uh, for detection. So one more question, actually. Um, uh, there is an ASO capped gold nanoparticle uh, with a specific size, like 20 nanometer you are talking about. So how difficult is to prepare such kind of gold nanoparticle uh, in the lab uh, and also how are the cost for uh, such kind of detection of what you are talking about, like a gold nanoparticle kit or a yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, kit? That's, that's a good question, uh, Dr. Zana. I think this is uh, important because uh, we are trying to keep the cost as low as possible. And our our goal here is to uh, make something in uh, in close to close to a few dollars uh, per test, so which is a lot less cheaper than um, running an RT-PCR because if you if you consider uh, the the person who is running it plus the cost of that person's so labor cost plus the reagents plus the machine cost so that is significant right um, so the gold particles have been around for a long time so that's one of the reasons we wanted to go after gold because uh, it's uh, we everyone knows how to you know like large companies when we try to scale it up for uh, a mass production, everyone knows how to make it in larger scale. So that is uh, that is uh, that is uh, that is really important here. Um, and antisense oligos, those are oligonucleotides, and those can be scaled up uh, very easily. Um, so that's a great question. I think this is something we need to really keep in mind uh, to keep and the cost under control. One more question: When will can expect this uh, kit in our market, in Indian market, or? Uh... <laughs> For the test of, uh, I, I cannot uh, tell about Indian market, but uh, we're we're trying hard to get the uh, pre-emergency use authorization done through FDA. So the FDA approval process is uh, in in progress, and uh, uh, my university tech transfer office is working uh, very hard to um, uh, to to work with uh, my team to uh, to get this developed. We're looking for um, um, you know serious partners to. Uh, to help also to scale up and for the mass production. Uh, and there is a lot of interest from uh, other countries uh, and, and particularly from Europe and, uh, and Latin American countries. Um, and they want license uh, for, uh, for our test. I cannot tell about Indian market. No one has reached out to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And which one is the best, uh, giving the best result, like uh, this gold nanoparticle directly or the graphene-based nanoparticle-based uh, uh, key? Actually? That's, that's again, a good question. See, I think, uh, I think uh, um, you know, once I don't have a one-size-fits-all solution. So it is really based on where we want to deploy it whether we want to give the patients or the consumers uh, uh, an opportunity to test themselves um, or we want to give uh, um, the community center schools to run um, a test or we want to give uh, hospitals to uh, an opportunity to run these tests uh, quickly. Um, so that th we have solution for all these three. So I think the plasmonic sensor would be best for home-based kit uh, the electrochemical would be best for a community-based testing um, and where you are really 
running a mass test or even at airports or you know uh, large gatherings where you can really um, you know quickly collect saliva and test it and get a result in less than five minutes. And uh, but then hospitals can use uh, a, a super sensitive uh, testing platform like uh, the last one, the hyperspectral one that we talked about. Uh one more question actually that uh, there is a, uh, this uh, whether nano formulated antiviral drug may be effective against novel coronavirus in infection yeah yeah so I, again i think uh, i think nanoparticle by itself uh, is not going to be it's not going to do anything but uh, the the role of nanoparticle would be as an excipient that means uh, to carry the carry the drug so as i and as i pointed out previously that um, uh, the, the time is coming when uh, two drugs will need to be delivered at a time because uh, um, the COVID does a lot of uh, uh, bad things to our body. In fact, what we're learning is that uh, the patients uh, above 60 years old, they are really prone to have, um, um, you know, heart disease uh, or, you know, infection in the heart and uh, a death from heart. So it will start uh, forming clots and uh, a lot of uh, vascular disease can happen or inflammation can happen from uh, this disease. So it is highly possible that two drugs needed to be uh, delivered at a time. And at that point, nanoparticle or nano delivery approach is going to be really, really useful. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pan. Sure, thank you. Thank you for not all all the questions. questions. Finally, once again, Dr. Pan, for your wonderful lecture and also informative lectures and also uh, very wonderful question and session. Uh, thank you very much from Athens Girls College. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm sorry I have to sign off. I have a, I'm already, I think, 10 minutes late for my uh, one of the meetings. Okay. If you can excuse okay. me, I have to, I have to sign off. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you. Uh, now I handed over the session to Dr. Dev Jani Sur. Thank you, Shuroji. Good evening, everyone. It is my honor to introduce our next speaker, Professor Ajay Kumar Mishra, who is going to talk on application of fundamental chemistry for the benefit of mankind. There is a huge demand for the development of simple, stable FL sensors. In this context, under the supervision of Professor Mishra, his research group has synthesized a number of spectroscopic probes, which act as selective sensors for detection of toxic metal ions. Professor Mishra is currently working as professor in the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Technology, Vidyashagar University, Midnapur, West Bengal. After completing PhD from Indian Association for Cultivation of Science, he joined the University of California, USA as postdoctoral fellow. His research interests include synthesis, characterization, and photophysical study of metals and semiconducting nanomaterials and low dimensional fluorescent organic materials. Professor Mishra has been working in this field for more than 20 years. He has more than 70 international publications in reputed journals in his credit. He has supervised more than 12 PhD theses. Professor Mishra has been awarded prestigious Professor Suresh Chandra Amita Award 2017 by Indian Chemical Society. We IQSC and Department of Chemistry, Asansol Gas College are highly privileged for his active participation as resource person in this webinar. On behalf of IQSC and Chemistry Department, Asansol Gas College, I welcome Professor Ajay Kumar Mishra in this webinar. So sir, please continue with your presentation. Sir, ki naam diya chin? Sir, meeting.
लिंक दिए ढुक
ইনাতি আবার ঢুকতে বলুন তো ইনাতি কল হ্যাঁ কল হিম Peru, you are not audible. there are some technical problem with the speaker uh, he has just restarted his system computer within one and two minute he will join Thank you. 